Greetings, it is March 18th and today is the anniversary of my dad's birth and he would be 91 today. Every time this year on my dad, his and also on my mom's birthday and on my brother's who is another person that I've lost, I think, wow, 91 years ago today, a little baby boy was born and he was the apple of his mother's eye and all the hopes and dreams of a beautiful life awaited him with a family that adored him and he grew up a happy little boy and so loved and cherished these are things that my dad shared with me over the years and 91 years later when i was a little kid 91 years seemed like a long long time but it's the blink of an eye and now my dad has been gone for 16 or 17 years now uh, he died when he was 73 years old which is way too young but i had him so i knew him i had a great relationship with him and i felt like any things that we needed to work out as a son growing up with a dad we had worked out but I, the only thing that kind of nags at me from time to time is that my dad isn't around so that my sons could get to know him even remotely in the way that I knew him and so I have to tell stories which is uh, their mom is pretty funny about that here's another story from dad about his dad but yeah that's the way you cher you cherish a loved one from the past and how you carry on his or her tradition and um my dad was a good man he was a very very good man he's 30 years older than me and boy did he uh really have a cool life and it was just way too short 73 ain't bad but uh, I sure would have loved it had he made it another 10 or 15 or imagine him being 91. I can't even imagine my dad having been around another 17 or 18 years. So I wanted to talk to you ever so briefly from Casa Pollard today about, well, one, springtime, because we're at the beginning of spring. And another cool thing is that it's a full moon today. And I love how the full moon is here on my dad's 91st birthday. We only get the full moon on our birthday every, what, it, what would a cycle be? Every 30 years or something like that, the length of a month, I would imagine. So it's a special one and it means a lot. And I saw the, the full moon, the almost full moon setting on the horizon this morning when I went out to put bird food out for the birds. And I will await its arrival this evening as the sun goes down over here on the east of the home and uh, we'll say a, a prayer and a message to my awesome dad who if people do look down from wherever they are I know he'll be looking down smiling and uh, wishing that he was remembered along with all the other beautiful people in my life that came before me. So the thing I really wanted to talk about today other than my pops was a little bit about the Norton Couloir I have a video that's on this YouTube channel that has gotten a lot of attention, not that much, 50 some odd thousand views or 40 some odd thousand views about the mystery of Mallory and Irvin and my experience in that story on the mountain. For those who don't know, in 1999 I was hired to be a high altitude cameraman on the Mallory and Irvin research expedition. And at the time when I got hired, honestly, I didn't really even know much about Mallory and Irvin. I mean, very little. Maybe I had heard stories. I had just become a member of the American Alpine Club. And so you heard stories of Everest lore. Uh, but I was more familiar with Sir Edmund Hillary and Tenzing, who we knew uh, as the people or still know as the people who first summited in 1953. And so when I went, really, I was at the mercy of, of what I was given as information for our ascent and our filming up high, and that was to go and trace Mallory and Irvin's route up as far as we knew them to last have been seen, or at least surmise them to have last been seen. 
look for their bodies, and see if we could make determination if they made it to the summit or not. Back then, I knew a little bit about the Norton Couloir, which is a more direct route across the North Face that goes straight up the summit period pyramid. Now, this is on the North Face from Tibet, looking south, essentially, as, as we look at the, the landscape of the mountain. And, uh, but, but we followed a route that I accepted at the time as having been that they tried the second step, which is the notorious second step, which until the 70s had, uh, was pretty much impossible to climb. And while Mallory and Irvin may have attempted the second step, there's no knowledge of whether they did or not. They, Mallory and Irvin were seen on the summit ridge by Noel O'Dell on June 8th, in the afternoon and he saw them for a very short amount of time and after he spotted their bodies getting up onto the ridge the clouds came in and they disappeared jake norton my friend from 1999 makes some great observations about that and shares photographs on his website i'll share the link to that on this on the show notes of it he shows about what a visual uh, representation really would be from the from like a human eye viewpoint not a zoomed in shot of the first second and third step and back then in 1924 during that expedition the third step wasn't really even recognized I don't even know if they called it the first step or the second step they per se they called it the second step but not the second step and so um, my inkling was always that Noel O'Dell saw them above the first step and not above the third or near the third step as many people like to believe th these days and many people believe that the people in the 99 expedition were were misinformed or dead wrong at looking at all the clues that we might find on the second step might be right we went back in 2019, I went with Mark Sinnott and Renan Ozturk and a, an amazing group of filmmakers. And we continued to do our searching in a spot that we had believed Irvin had been found. We made no presuppositions that it was the second step. Of course, we talked about the second step a lot, but it wasn't as much about did they do the second step or, or not. It was that we were looking for Irvin's body, which we did not find, unfortunately. But um, my good friend, Jochen Hemleb, who many of you know, he's a, an Everest historian, and I believe one of the most knowledgeable in terms of the facts of the expedition. I, I spoke to him a little bit about the Norton Kuwar route, and he believes, yeah, indeed, that it, back in the pre-war era, at least before the ladder was placed on the second step, that the Norton Couloir probably would have offered a better chance of success for Mallory and Irvin. But really, all we really know is that there was an oxygen bottle found at the, near the first step, before you get to the first step, essentially where Norton and Somerville had been previously. So... Um, we really don't know anything after that, and, and people can say what they want about Odell. They can, they can guess one way or the other, but Odell did change his story on numerous of occasions. When he spoke with Bradford Washburn back in the 1980s, I believe, he visited Boston, and Brad asked him point blank, show me on this topographical map, where did you see Mallory and Irvin? And Odell pointed to a spot above the first step, not where many people like to put him at. Did he reverse his story in later years? Yes, no, maybe. Uh, anybody who says they absolutely know which way Mallory and Irvin went certainly does not know. And probably the most troubling thing in all of this is that while there are so many people drawn to this incredible mystery, and it's one of the most amazing stories of um, adventure and mountaineering certainly that has ever happened you'd think that people would come together to try to solve it but what's happened is there's been a, a faction of people who believe very strongly in the the route that i have very little knowledge about that have taken it to a personal level and and 
it's mind-boggling to me that that people can well let's put it this way i blocked a lot of comments on my youtube video and and recently i actually just turned comments off altogether it anybody all i want to say is anybody who says they know and that somebody else does not know is a fool that's all i'm going to tell you and i respect everybody's opinions on what might have happened but nobody knows i don't care if mallory wrote 500 times in a notebook or to letters that he intended to take the Norton Couloir route, it doesn't mean anything. When you get up to high altitude, things change. Things change dramatically due to the weather, due to certain conditions, due to oxygen. We don't even know if they got past the oxygen bottle that was found near or at the base of the first step. We know nothing really other than that Odell did see them and where they were at that sighting, we really don't know. We do not know. Did they make it to the summit? My gut tells me they did not make it to the summit. I would love to think that they did, but here's why I don't think they made it. The position of Mallory's body was a very long distance east of even the first and second step, or of the second step at least, you know, kind of the fall line, and east of where Irvin's ice axe was found in 1939. And in order for them to have gotten to the summit and all the way back down where we found Mallory's body, at least above that on the fall line of it, would have been, in my opinion, impossible. No, but, but I don't know. I'm not telling anybody that I'm right because I Nobody knows. Nobody can tell. I just don't think that they made it. I looked at Mallory's face. His, his face was in good condition other than the hole over his eye, which I, I have a couple of ideas on that, and I'll talk about that in another video sometime. His fingers were frostbitten. His hands were, but his toes were in very, very good shape. So what this really is about is that we don't know. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. A thing about it. This is a mystery that will probably endure forever unless the camera is found. And now the whole thing about pebbles in the pocket. I thoroughly checked every single pocket on the front of Mallory's body. There was nothing in his pocket that would say, here's a pebble or here's a rock. Because believe me, we took everything out of that by you know, and took care to not lose anything that was in his pocket. I re the, one of the reasons that I can tell you for sure that we got everything out is when I took his watch out of his pocket, the crystal was gone. There was no broken crystal. The crystal was gone 100% entirely. There were no shards or anything. So which surmised to, to come to the belief that the watch crystal was broken, then Mallory took it off, put it in his pocket at that time. So in looking through his pocket, I did not find even a, a tiny shard of crystal. And believe me, I looked really thoroughly at the time and we kept absolutely everything with the exception that the hour hand of the watch fell off and it was lost. It was in a Ziploc baggie with uh, Andy Politz and I were up at Camp 5 at about 26,000 feet and somehow that little hour hand got away from us. We do have one photograph of it with the hour hand on it. But uh, yeah, the mystery endures. So if anybody tells you they know, they don't. And if anybody tells you that the other people for thinking differently are a fool, well, you know how I feel about that. I, I have a respect for everybody's opinion on this. Um, the only place where I start to get off the tracks and get off the train and stop communicating with people is when they start to accuse others and, and kind of take it to a personal level. I'm just not interested in that. This is a mystery that we can all come together in. And uh, don't we need a little more togetherness in this world, given what's going on with Russia and the Ukraine? Uh, my, my love and blessings go out to all those people of all those countries. And, um, you know, so maybe we could take a hint from that and, and bring it together as a community and try to solve the mystery or at least have a discussion about the mystery as a, you know, decent people and, and respectful, caring people. So my respect goes to you, and if you believe differently, so cool. High five. 
awesome. Have a great March 18th. Uh, hat, tip of the hat to my dad, George Puzz Pollard. That was his nickname. Uh, the man, the myth, the legend. I miss him dearly. And uh, I hope you guys all have a great day. Thanks for taking the time to listen. Cheers.